us. Okay, we are in Tennessee, Tennessee. on our way to see Jack the Jack Daniels tour, where it's all made. And um, after that, we're gonna go up to uh, Nashville for the evening. And uh, tomorrow, we're gonna go to Memphis. See Elvis. Yeah, we're gonna go see Elvis. And uh, the trip is going very well. We're going to start talking about the history of Jack Daniels whiskey. Going to show you guys some historical sites on the property today. And then we'll start talking about production. Going to tell you how we make Jack Daniels whiskey. Take you guys to our production buildings as well. Then our tour ends up in our oldest and smallest barrel house of the property built in 1938 after Tennessee Prohibition. Here in about an hour or so, we're going to be inside that barrel house, and that's where you guys get to sample our premium limited edition whiskeys today. So again, hope you're all excited for that. Yeah. Woo I'm excited for you guys to try those whiskeys. Now, in order to get to those whiskeys at the end, there's some rules of the tour path you guys got to follow. Yeah, boo, rules, right? I knew this was going to be a rowdy crowd that doesn't like to follow rules, man. Yeah, not these ones right here, man. <laughs> now, these rules are pretty simple to follow. They're not too bad. The first rule is we just need to stick together as a group. This is a working distillery. Got a lot of traffic coming in and out of here. We also have security around here. You get split up for me on the tour path, they will find you. They put you on a different tour. You don't get to sample whiskeys on that tour. So, came here to sample pretty simple. Follow me. Now, as long as we're outside, you guys can take as many photos outside along the tour path as you want. A couple spots on the tour we can't take photos due to safety reasons. I'll let you know that when we get there, but as long as we're outside, you guys can take as many photos as you like. The last rule of the tour path, this one's a no-brainer. No smoking on the tour path. That includes e-cigarettes. Here at Jack Daniels, we do make pretty flammable liquid. 140 proof, 70% grain alcohol. So, some people call it moonshine. Some people call it white lightning. Me and this fellow right here, we call that stuff good times. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely wouldn't be a good time if somebody smoked on the tour path. That was pretty simple to follow. That's rules of the tour path, guys. Now, welcome to Lynchburg, Tennessee, Moore County, home of Jack Daniels Whiskey. Every drop of Jack Daniels produced for the world is made right here in Lynchburg, Tennessee, Moore County. Moore County here, it is a dry county. It's been dry since Prohibition. If you're unfamiliar with the term dry county, it basically means there's no alcohol sales in the county limits. But here at Jack, we're allowed to do some things despite that dry county law. Found some loopholes that law, guys. Got great <laughs> lawyers around here. <laughs> One of those loopholes is we offer sampling tours. Now you guys get to sample some whiskeys here in a dry county today because we have to classify that as an educational experience. Yeah, we want to get smart. Yeah, that's right. It's educational. We do that here in a dry county. Looks like we got some graduates on this bus. So this is the doctor of course today for y'all, man. Yeah. Still, still haven't learned everything, my good man. Now we also sell bottles of whiskey inside our bottle shop inside the visitor center. It's called the White Rabbit Bottle Shop. Now there's some whiskeys in there. You might not get anywhere else but that bottle shop. So we can classify that as a souvenir. Yeah, oh, souvenir. You can sell souvenirs in Dry County. Oh yeah. We're good with words around here, guys. Now the last loophole is actually for us employees here at Jack Daniels. The first Friday of every month for working here. We get a free bottle of old number seven with our paycheck, guys. Oh, yeah. A great perk of working here, y'all. Yeah. This past, uh, where you sign up, hey, they hire me, they'll hire anybody, my good man. Yeah. I'll get to that here in just a second and tell you what that day is called. But as Mr. Johnny's coming down the hill here, we have a building to our right. We also have a building to our left here. These are a couple of our barrel houses, y'all. Each one of them, they hold 20,000 barrels of whiskey. At 53 gallons per barrel, a million gallons, a little over a million gallons of Jack Daniels in each one of those barrel houses right there. All of our barrel houses are built similar, around seven stories or seven floors tall. Each one of them are not air conditioned. We let Mother Nature dictate how long it'll take for a barrel whiskey to mature. We say it takes where from four to seven years. A couple of barrel houses behind us here. Be a couple more I'm going to point out once we get off the bus here in just a second. We see some deer around here, turkey. Wild turkeys. Yeah, man. 
We call those corporate spies around here. Some wild turkey, baby. Yeah. Got a lot of lame jokes for the whole tour. You all strap in, man. So around 4.30, 5 o'clock each day, we'll go, uh, start getting shipments of grain in. And so a lot of the wildlife know that because they'll come down here and grab up some grain that gets spilt on the ground a little bit. So a lot of the wildlife will start making its way down this way around this time of day. Now back to that dry uh, county loophole for us. That first Friday of every month, we get a free bottle of old number seven. We call it Good Friday around here, y'all. Everybody shows up to work on time. Nobody calls on Good Friday. This past Friday was Good Friday for us, so we all showed up to work on time. We all have a good time around here at Jack. 94 total barrel houses here at Jack. We're planning to build five more in the next five years. We supply for the world here, guys. We gotta get whiskeys to, to Canada. We gotta get whiskeys to you party folks as well. Got a lot of booze around here, y'all. Follow me this way. Yes, yes. Follow me this way. Let's go check out our Rick Yard. Again, feel free to take photos you like. Beautiful day to do so. This is our Rick Yard. This is where we make our charcoal for our mellowing process. Back in Jack's day, that process was called the Lincoln County process. Process we still use today. Process is distilling 140 proof, 7% grain alcohol, moonshine, white lightning. We take that alcohol, we'll send it through 10 feet of charcoal. That is the step that separates us from being a bourbon. Now a little bit later in the tour, I'll take you guys up to show you our charcoal milling area. In there, we'll discuss what that process does to our alcohol or whiskey. But down here in our rickyard, we're just going to discuss how we make our charcoal. Now, we have two gentlemen here that are in charge of making our charcoal. Names are Darren and Tracy. We've been making our charcoal for almost 20 years. They make our charcoal on an as-needed basis, Monday through Friday. So depending on how much charcoal they make throughout the week determines how many burns throughout the week they do. Generally, they get here at 5, 5.30 in the morning, usually done sometime in the afternoon. Obviously, not making any charcoal right now. So follow me down this way. We'll discuss it All further, right, guys. So when Darren and Trace are ready to make some charcoal, they'll take four stacks of the hard sugar maple ricks, these stacks of wood that we have around the rick yard here. The term rick is basically any measurement of wood. Hard sugar maple, of course, is the wood species that we use. They'll take four stacks. They put under this EPA-approved hood over here. Then to start a fire, they spray the inside of those ricks with their very own alcohol whiskey straight from our still. 140 proof, 7% grain alcohol. This can right here says whiskey for destruction. This is what they use. They'll take this spray can, spray the inside of those ricks, a lot of match, get the fire started. Now, the tricky part of making that charcoal is putting out the fire at the right time. Of course, they let that fire go too long, end up with ash, put off too soon, too much water, unburnt pieces of wood. So get it again, it takes about an hour and a half to two hours for that to burn on down. Once they fully douse out a pile of charcoal, just with regular water, we're gonna have larger chunks of charcoal, charcoal that we got displayed in this barrel over here to our left. Take those larger chunks of charcoal, send them to our charcoal crushing area, building over here to our left. It was to our left as we're walking up this way. Crush it on down to a smaller pea size gravel consistency, what we have in the barrel over here to our right. What that allows us to do is to pack our charcoal milling vat 10 feet deep of the charcoal. Allows the alcohol or whiskey to travel through a little bit easier. It's going to take around two days for one drop of alcohol to get through 10 feet of charcoal. And later in the tour, I'm going to show you guys that process. We'll discuss what that does for whiskey. But any questions about how we make our charcoal? Is that charcoal activated charcoal? Yeah, so what they got to do for it, or once it gets all chopped up and put in a, um, in a vat, they have to do what's called floating it. So they'll send water through there to get extra soot off of it and stuff. So then the first pass through of alcohol that goes through there has to be absorbed into the charcoal. That's what activates the charcoal to start the filtration process. So there's no color or flavor added during the charcoal milling process. It's taking away corn oils, fatty acids, and bitter notes out of there. So to activate that charcoal, like that gentleman's saying, we'll send some through there. It has to be absorbed in the charcoal. That's what starts the filtration process. Yeah, we'll go over that again a little bit later in the tour as well. But yeah, good question. Most people don't have questions about this though, because it's a pretty simple process. Light a match, let it go on fire. Now, real quick, hard sugar maple is the same wood species used to make maple syrup. Back in Jack's day, they thought it would add a sweetness to the whiskey because of that. Over time, science has proven it doesn't add anything to it. It's a filtration process, basically how a Brita filter works at home for you. All right, guys, a couple things before we head on out of here. We're gonna have us some fun. I'm gonna come around and spray you guys hands off moonshine straight from our still. This is for educational purposes right here, yeah. Hold out those hands, we're gonna spray those hands off, rub your hands together, smell your hands, lick your hands, just don't lick anybody else's hands. That's kind of weird and awkward to see. People have done it before. It's usually the couples that aren't afraid to show their appreciation for each other, yeah. Hold out your hand, oh, do, oh okay. There you go, why did they put it like that spray? Like, there we go. 
I don't know why it's people do the streams, man. That's dumb. All right, hold out those hands. Notice how oily this is. This will come into play when we talk about charcoal melting a little bit later in the tour. Fire brigade or fire department on hand, just in case we ever had a fire on the premise. It's a mutual fire department. They respond to fires in town. Now, we actually had a house fire a couple years ago. They responded to that house fire, helped take care of that fire. Now, our fire department's actually by our uh, main uh, bottling facility, which is two miles south of town here. Uh, majority of our equipment's over there, fire department stuff. What we have here in front of us, an old relic that we used to use. This engine right here is a 1919 America La France. It's an old crank start engine. It does not run anymore, but if it did, you'd have to put it in reverse to get it to go uphill. So it's an old gravity fed engine. Now, normally we have a second vehicle over here. It's a 1928 REO Speedwagon. It still runs, of course, and we put it in parades promoting our Tennessee Fire Liqueur. Last time I heard it was up in Indianapolis at a Doobie Brothers concert. So it goes around and promotes our Tennessee Fire Liqueur. Of course, you guys might have heard the band name, REO Speedwagon. REO stands for Ransom Eli Olds. He was the father of Oldsmobile from 1904 to 1924. So cool, fun fact, you guys didn't know that beforehand. Don't stand on them. Come on up, check it out. Cage Spring area, it's our water source for whiskey. Come on up, check it out, take you some photos. Is that from a well? Or is that from a yeah, so, yes. Yeah, so, um, in the early 80s, we uh, sent cave spunkers down through this cave to search for the source of the spring, that aquifer. Yep. They said they traveled a mile and a half back in there, and it got so narrow at that point they couldn't travel any further. They say that spring source at aquifers about uh, past that mile and a half point. Yeah, so supposedly this thing goes about a mile and a half back in there. Never been back there myself. Don't like enclosed spaces, claustrophobic. So you could pay me two million dollars to go down through How there, do you man. Keep the bats out? The bats out. There's a sonar thing in the back there that we can't hear, but they'll hear it and blast them out of here. Yeah, yeah. Well, that was a good oh yeah, yeah. Somebody asked me before, and I was like, "Ooh, shoot, I don't know." I said maybe Batman's back there or something yeah, like that. Yeah. Right? But now, if that's the cool thing about working here, is I won't be BS anybody if I don't know the answer. I'll tell you, and then I'll go ask the question later. So, yep. They told me there's some sonar things back there. Sends out a, a thing where it keeps bats out of here. Every once in a while, birds will come around, and you'll see some bird poop around here and whatnot, but you know, we can't help that. But, all right guys, so uh, real quick, Cave Spring area, it's our water source for whiskey. Now before I let you know what makes the water in here so special, I'm gonna open up the history books, tell you how Jack became a whiskey distiller. Now in the 1860s, Jack moved out of his childhood home before he was a teenager. Moved to a farm about five miles south from here. Farm is owned by Reverend Dan Call. Now Reverend Dan Call, of course, was Reverend of a ministry, but he was also a businessman. He distilled whiskey. Now during those times, before the Emancipation Proclamation and the Civil War, so he had an enslaved man by the name of Nathan Nearest Green who oversaw his whiskey making operation. Now Jack, of course, growing up on that farm, he grew interested in making whiskey. So it was Reverend Dan Call and Nearest who taught Jack how to make whiskey. But it was Nearest Green who taught Jack the most about how to make whiskey. That became Jack's lifelong passion. Yeah, fast forward in time, Jack actually hired Nearest Green as our first head distiller. What we call a master distiller nowadays post emancipation. We'll talk more about Jack and Nearest relationship when we get to Jack's old office here in just a few minutes. Eventually, Reverend Dan Castle distills his operation to Jack. At that point, Jack was on the lookout for good water source to make good whiskey. So I happened to find this cave spring right here. Found out it made some pretty incredible whiskey, moved his operation over here. It's why we're still here today. So again, why every drop of Jack Daniels produced for the world, every job that you've had. It's come from right over here, about 100 yards from us, production, still house right over here. It's due to the Cave Spring Arrows location right here. What makes the water in here so special? Number one reason is it's iron free. It's iron free to the Tennessee limestone that you see around us right here. Limestone filters out any iron, other impurities in the water, also adds minerals and nutrients, which adds the character and flavor for whiskey. Also stays 56 degrees or a little bit below all year round inside the Cave Spring area. Stays that temperature back in there. No sunlight gets to the water. No bacteria can grow in that environment. Only filtration system we're using is a sand screen filtration system, making sure sediment doesn't get sent to production. Every once in a while on the tours, you hear our water pump go off back in there, 30 yards back inside the cave spring area. It sucks water underground and sends it straight to our fermentation area. All right, guys, feel free to take some photos here if you like. Once you're done, head to the statue of Mr. Jack right over there. You guys can take some photos with him. I'm going to be the last one out here. Make sure nobody tries to jump in the cave spring. It <laughs> happened earlier this spring, no joke. Get out. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
tour guide Kimmy, she said uh, she was walking up there. She had a whole group up there, except for two gentlemen were down here. They were taking off their shirts and stuff, and she's really funny. She goes, hey, gentlemen, this is not Chippendales, all right? Come on this way. They weren't listening to her, and they were about to jump in, so she actually had to call security, and they hauled them out of here and stuff. But yeah, that actually happened yeah, this past way over here if you want. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, do your thing, man. Yeah, did you see the prices of that stuff back in the day? Two fifty per gallon, three dollars per gallon, six dollars per gallon. And the only way to say, hey, I'm the age of twenty one, you just signed your name. All right, y'all, we're gonna go ahead and finish up the history lesson in here. So the picture above the fireplace right there, that's the man, Mr. Jasper Newton Daniel. Jasper was Jack's real name. He didn't like his real name Jasper. He liked people calling him by his nickname Jack, kind of stuck. Now the picture to my right above the desk right there, that's Mr. Lynn Motlow, that's Jack's nephew, worked alongside Jack until Jack passed away in 1911. Will the distillery to Lim. Lim eventually will the distillery to his four sons, the Motlow brothers, picture my right over here. Robert Rieger, Connor Happ, 1956, Motlow brothers sold the distillery to Brown Foreman, a liquor company out of Louisville, Kentucky. Brown Foreman is still our parent company to this day. I'm gonna back all the way up and tell you how Mr. Jack Daniel died and how this all became to be. He died because of this very safe that's right over here. Yeah, that is the safe that killed Jack Daniel. Now, story goes, 1905, Jack showed up to work on one day and that was unusual. Usually, Lim would be here first. He'd open up the safe, he got the paperwork out, got the day started, but Jack beat him to the punch one day, 1905. Jack forgot how to open up that safe. Tried it several times, couldn't open it, got so mad and frustrated, kicked the safe with his left foot, ended up breaking his left toe in the process. Now, just like in us guys, we hurt ourselves, we're embarrassed about it. Don't want to tell anybody about it. We try to man up and walk it off, right, gentlemen? Yeah. Right. <laughs> That's what Mr. Jack did. That's a very bad thing because Gain Green eventually set up in his toe a blood infection. Amputated the toe, didn't stop the infection. Traveled all the way up his left leg, amputated all the way up his hip. But eventually, in the year 1911, at the age of 61 years old, he dealt with it for six years. The day he died on, October 9th of 1911. So on this day in 1911, at that time right up there, 1251. He died from complications kicking this very safe that's right over here. It is a very sad, weird story to tell everybody comes on tour. It's a true story. It needs to be told because there's a lot of life lessons we learn from that story, guys. <laughs> One life lesson you take home with you tonight, all right? You remember what it is? Don't kick the safe. Oh, yeah. No, I thought you know the other one. Don't go to work early. It might kill you, all right? Yeah. That'll keep you safe out there, man. Follow me this way. Let's go talk production. We get on out of here. First thing is, is, once we get done with our sour mash, we take that used mash, we pump it through these pipes right over here. We'll send it over to Slop Hill, sell it to local farmers to feed their livestock. Used mash is high in protein. Also got a little alcohol left behind. Cows like to party here at Lynchburg, y'all. <laughs> Makes a cow tipping a lot easier around here if you're into that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah, so they have to kind of refine it a little bit uh, to make it into cow feed. Now, here in the future, they're getting away from that because not a lot of farmers are coming in and get it as much as they used to. Uh, and so we've teamed up with an energy corporation. They're going to take the used mash and convert it into natural gas. Don't, don't ask me how they're going to do that. Uh, the super smart people out there can do that. They're going to provide natural gas for the area around here. And they're also gonna make like fertilizer and stuff for farms. So they're gonna give that fertilizer to free to the uh, farm uh, farmers that are affected by that. So kind of nice little olive branch there for them. So in the future, we're gonna turn that into natural gas. So that's pretty cool. All right, guys, real quick, you guys might've noticed something around here. Well, there's all the stuff that's on our buildings and trees around here. Check out this tree right back behind me here. It's covered in this stuff. It's what's called a microflora. It's a microorganism that lives off alcohol vapors in the air. The closer you get production, especially on our barrel houses, you'll see this stuff growing. It's not harmful in one, not harmful in anything. It just kind of looks unsightly. It's what revenueers used to look for during prohibition. Go out in the woods looking for what they call black frost on the trees to catch illegal stills back in those days. So if you were a smart distiller, you would move your stills every so often. But again, called a microflora, it's a microorganism that lives off alcohol vapors in the air. Speaking of alcohol vapors in the air, follow me this way. Let's go check out Charcoal Melon, get a good smell the of sights, the smells, the possible pass outs. You never know what the hell could happen up in here. It's like life. It's a roll of the dice, baby. Yeah. All right, guys, so real quick, single barrel bottling line, all of our single barrel products for the world get bottled in here. This used to be the bottling center for all of Jack Daniels. Of course, got a little bit bigger, started making more whiskeys. Again, main bottling facility two miles south of town here, 24-7 down there. 
but all of our single barrel products for the world get bottled Monday through Friday. There's a whiteboard in the back that tells you what they're doing for the day. Uh, so tomorrow they are bottling, let's see, 300, so uh, a little under 1,200 uh, three-liter bottles of old number seven for Australia and New Zealand. They're doing 300 more bottles for Mexico and 6,000 bottles for uh, somewhere in Europe. So they bottle for the world in here, but only Monday through Friday. Again, main uh, bottling facility 24-7 down there. Follow me this way, head to the barrel house, get your drink on. I need them after listening to me the past hour. <laughs> yeah. Come on in. Uh, four to seven years, so depending oh on each floor of the barrel house will determine when a barrel's ready. So the whiskeys that are on the bottom floor of a barrel house is kind of like the base of your home, so, so it stays cool year round. It takes a little bit longer for those to mature. Middle floor of the barrel house, that's kind of the control. Those are done four to five years. The top floors, like the attic in your home, those are done three, four, uh, three or four years. <laughs> Come on in, guys. <laughs> Uh, so we're allowed to do this in a dry county because this is an educational experience. You're not here to get shit-faced or anything like that, like at a bar. So we're just here to learn how to drink some whiskey. Sober so, mind. So we're going to start left, make our way right like we're reading a book. So the first one up needs no introduction. It is old number seven, also called Black Label, most recognizable whiskey label world, one of the top selling whiskeys in the world. Last year we sold 17.6 million cases of old number seven worldwide. The next one, the next one is an ultra special treat for you guys. It is Sinatra Select, part of our limited edition whiskey line. Now this whiskey, so you guys are digging that one and you should because this is our most expensive bottle of whiskey or most sought after bottle of whiskey as well. This bottle right here when available at our bottle shop costs $150, that includes tax. All right guys, we'll go ahead and go on to the next one. The next one is my personal favorite whiskey of ours. It is Single Barrel Select, part of our Single Barrel Collection. Premium whiskey line. This whiskey comes from the top floors of our barrel house. It's kind of like the attic in your home up there. It's super hot in the summer, super cold in the winter. Those extreme temperature fluctuations force the whiskey in and out of the barrel more vigorously. You get a uniquely flavored whiskey. I like that. All right, guys. So um, before we do this next one, you better strap in because this next one is a doozy. The next one is the definition of a sipping whiskey. If you're not used to drinking whiskeys, do not throw this one down. Let me tell you why. Next one on the board there is single barrel barrel proof. All of our whiskeys, once they're done mature, we cut that whiskey with the deionized water to get it to that specific proof. This bad boy right, on, right here, we don't cut it at all. Straight from the barrel, right to the bottle, no cutting necessary. Like every barrel can have its own unique flavor, it can also have its own unique proof as well. Proof can vary from a measly 125, not much there. All the way up to 140 plus proof, depending on what happened to that barrel. What you guys are trying today, 131.5 proof, yeah. Oh. High octane stuff right here. Oh. Now don't be alarmed, don't be afraid of the high proof there. You might be surprised how smooth barrel proof is. Go ahead and get your good nose and sip of that. Tell me what you think about barrel proof. <laughs> See if you guys would have had this at the start of the uh, tour, you guys have been way too rowdy by this time. Yeah. yeah. I feel like you said it, that mm -hmm. metaphor rapidly. Yeah. I, just, and I can guarantee you that. Pretty extreme stuff right there, guys. So this one right here, if I'm drinking this, it's on the rocks with a good splash of water. Doesn't nullify any of that taste. Kind of helps out with the barrel warmth or barrel hug at the back end right there. Now, if you're ever interested in buying a barrel proof bottle, at the bottom of the bottle, it's got its own label down there. Tells you the specific proof of that bottle of whiskey. Now, another little tidbit of information about barrel proof, uh, any of our products or any barrel proof products, uh, uh, different uh, varieties, if you're ever out in a store and they're selling a high proof whiskey at a higher price than a lower one, they can't do that. They have to sell it at that lower price. So just to let you know, a higher proof whiskey of the same product cannot be sold, uh, or it's got to be sold at the same price as a lower one. Okay. So yeah. All right, y'all. Last but not least is single barrel rye. All of our whiskeys use the same grain bill or recipe as old number seven, 80% corn, 12% barley, 8% rye. Rye whiskey, we flip the script, rye is the dominant grain at 70% rye, 18% corn, 12% barley. This is bottle like select, 94 proof from the states, 90 in most of the countries. If you've never had a rye whiskey before, when you smell the rye, that rye grain can have a soft fruit smell to it, kind of like a banana. When you taste rye, it tastes nothing like it smells. It's gonna finish dry and peppery. It's kind of a quiet taste. Go ahead and try the rye. Oh yeah. Probably my least favorite whiskey because I love the pepperiness of it. Just not a big fan of the dry after taste. But each drone, it's a uh, it's a acquired uh, taste right there. Yeah. Not my favorite.
All right, guys, there's some stuff you can take home with you this evening. That piece of paper is yours. The sample cup's yours. Make sure there's no samples in those cups when you leave this room. And the coaster is yours as well. And unfortunately for you, the board stays on the table. Boy, thank God, maybe over here and get you guys back to visit. Well, I'm going to incorporate it when you talked about it. He's definitely making eye contact with the driver. He wants to hunt. We're going to take your picture. We're going to take your picture. I think he's waiting to go on the bus. 